Please. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me first share my screen. Okay, and let me first ask the fundamental question of science in 2021. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, good. Uh, let me uh, play. Uh, right, so first of all, I am so sorry not to be uh, at, at rack time. I uh, enjoy rack time uh, very much every single time. Uh, but I have to be in the uh, US, so hello from, uh, fr from Boston, uh, but next month I'm in Europe permanently. Uh, okay, so uh, that was a great talk before by uh, Guillermo, and I will actually say uh, I will be talking about things quite related and uh, even, even similar, but maybe a little broader about the uh, Event Horizon uh, Telescope observations, uh, as I am a part of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. And I will attempt to make some classification of the features in the, uh, in, in the observed uh, image. Uh, so let, let's see how it uh, how it goes. Uh, so uh, the, this is a slide I'm sh always showing to indicate the Event Horizon Telescope as a big uh, collaboration of many people doing a lot of different uh, things, all the way from design of the uh, engineering equipment of uh, the electronic receivers to perform the observations, all the way downstream to the theoretical uh, interpretation. So this is why we need uh, more than 200 people people to actually deliver uh, the science we uh, we want to uh, deliver. Uh, M87, the object uh, that we kind of focus uh, in all the all these talks, uh, the supermassive black hole in the center of the M87 uh, galaxy in a, a Virgo cluster. And so this is the only resolved black hole shadow uh, so far. Uh, it is resolved uh, by the EHT images with the effective resolution of, of about uh, three Schwarzschild radii. And anything you go, uh, you get below that is a super resolution, which is not a fantasy. There is such thing as a super resolution for uh, non-uniformly uh, sampled um, uh, images in particular. Uh, but you know, you may uh, not trust that much the features that are below three Schwarzschild radii. Fortunately, the shadow of a black hole, the prediction of uh, general relativity, is that uh, the shadow of a black hole should be more than five Schwarzschild radii in diameter because of the um, uh, gravitational lensing effect. So this is why we can trust the, the, the central feature that there is this central darkness. And how we interpret it, that's a part of the, of the theory. We are saying that this is a signature of a presence of highly redshifted area, and we want to say event horizon, but of course we should we should hesitate as there is no electromagnetic proof uh, for the event uh, presence of event horizon um, uh, th th that is uh, theoretically possible. I see I didn't change to, to rack time. Yes, these are slides I gave <laughs> in July as some um, other uh, summer program. Sorry for for that. Um, oh, here I did change to rack time. Uh, so I will uh, now very briefly uh, show you a couple of slides about the, the story of this um, uh, feature that we call a shadow. I will, uh, in the second part of my talk, I will elaborate uh, on this, uh, on the dictionary, what, what we would call a shadow, what we would call a photon ring and such and such. But let's start here. Let's start from Bardeen, 1973, who was the first uh, person to calculate the appearance of, uh, of a Kerr black hole if it was illuminated from behind by like a wall of photons, what would be the outline of uh, the uh, location of photons that are uh, that fall into the uh, horizon and which are reaching the uh, distant uh, observer. You can call it the outline of, of the photon sphere or uh, the outline of the photon shell. Uh, many people call it shadow. Uh, I will 
uh, use a different dictionary, but we'll, we'll get to this dictionary uh, of, of different terms um, uh, a, a little bit later. Uh, so for, for this teacher, we prefer, at least I prefer, to call it critical curve. Uh, this is this outline of the photon shell uh, or what Bardeen calculated for the Kerr black hole. And here you can see how this feature changes as we uh, turn the knob of the uh, black hole uh, spin. And this is a fun quote here from Bardeen, uh, who, uh, well, who considered that conceptually interesting, maybe not astrophysically very important, but also uh, hopeless to, to observe. Uh, so that was uh, 1973, but uh, well, not even 50 years later, we did observe something uh, alike um, with the Event Horizon Telescope. So when the uh, story uh, goes to 1978, uh, and an image uh, calculated uh, and painted uh, by hand by uh, Jean-Pierre Lumine, uh, where he calculated 10,000 uh, trajectories of photons and manually uh, created this uh, figure based on this numerical uh, result. So this is the image of a thin disk surrounding uh, a black hole. And now I will start uh, marking these dictionary uh, things. So I will refer to a shadow. Uh, as a shadow, I will refer to a general feature. General feature of there being something bright and some depression of flux, uh, some redshifted area uh, in the middle of it. And there are some uh, other features so I am here po pointing out to this sharp, narrow feature uh, as a photon ring. Um, so this is the highly lensed copy, the magnified copy of the, of the main image that uh, contains photons that traveled at least half a loop around the, uh, the photon shell. So this is a really highly lensed uh, feature. Uh, then the history will you know, move forward 20 years um, uh, uh, to, to the future, to 1999, uh, where uh, people started considering not the uh, shadows, not the images of thin disks, but actual uh, images of uh, RIAPs or ADAPs, so radiatively inefficient accretion flows or uh, advection dominated accretion flows. These are the accretion flows characteristic to low luminosity AGNs, uh, which are optically thin, geometrically thick, puffed up, and they will look slightly different than the images of thin disks, uh, particularly between, because of the geometry, that this is actually uh, a thick uh, uh, emitting region. Uh, so when uh, Heino Falke uh, wrote this paper uh, suggesting that we could observe uh, Sagittarius A star, the, the black hole in the center of our galaxy, uh, which, I, by the way, I really hoped to be talking to you about uh, uh, at this time, about EHT results on the Sagittarius, but unfortunately it looks like it's the next track time when I will uh, be able to talk about uh, results on Sagittarius A star. Um, uh, right, and uh, you see that there is this optimistic theoretical expectation that uh, we could make such an image within a few years. It turned out to be 20 years because the practice is uh, usually more difficult uh, than, uh, than theory, I would say. Uh, okay, and this is the, another famous image from the Interstellar movie. And you can also see here that there is this direct image, the, the shadow, so the general feature, something bright and something dark inside. But there is also this highly lensed feature, which is a, a photon ring. So again, photons that looped around the, um, uh, the black hole, they are more highly lensed than this direct image here. And then we have uh, GRMHD, General Relativistic Magnetohydrodynamic uh, Simulations, providing us with something we hope to be more realistic representation of this flow, uh, of, of how, how this image of a black hole should look like. And again, you can see the direct emission shadow feature, and you can see a bunch of highly lensed uh, well, at least one highly lensed feature here, which is uh, the, the photon ring. It's actually not, not super visible in this particular image I see. Uh, this is a movie that I will, should I run it? Maybe I will, oh, 
okay, let's let's run this movie. So, uh, well, this is a, a fragment of GRMHD simulation put on the background of uh, of uh, stars. We, it shouldn't be visible in radio, so this is a component composite image of optical and radio emission, and this is how we envision approaching a black hole, uh, what the GRMHD simulations are, uh, are telling us. So you saw this uh, uh, protruding jets, and uh, now we are uh, changing the inclination and we're going uh, uh, along the jet, uh, we are falling into the, into the black hole. And this is, for example, how we would expect M87 would look in millimeter wavelength. All of that is wavelength dependent and what are the opacities uh, where is the emission happening is depending on the on the wavelength. So this is the one millimeter expectation for the M87 uh, black hole. Okay, and now we are in the black hole. Um, a few words about the very long baseline interferometry, the technique that makes uh, this possible. The very long baseline interferometry is something that gives us the highest resolution uh, at this moment in, in astronomy. So it, it is our best tool to probe um, such extremely compact objects like uh, black holes. Uh, I think Guillermo mentioned a little bit that we are observing visibilities. That is correct. We are, uh, this is an interferometer. We are not observing directly the image. We are observing Fourier components of the, uh, of the image, which is what interferometers do. And if you make this simple calculation, uh, relating to the resolution of the event horizon telescope or the resolution necessary to observe a black hole. Uh, well, we, we have a prior on mass from dynamics of stars uh, surrounding M87. The prior tells us that the shadow should be about 50 micro arc second across, which means for the to resolve it, we need like, let's say 20 micro arc seconds and 20 micro arc seconds is one millimeter by 10,000 uh, kilometers, which uh, he, here is, this is just a resolution criterion. So the wavelength divided by the diameter of the telescope. So you see that we need one millimeter wavelength, which is pretty much the shortest radio wavelength we could use. Uh, and if we do that, we need 10,000 kilometers telescope, which is about the diameter of the Earth. So we really need to put together a bunch of telescopes around the globe, use the Earth as a dish, and synthesize our aperture with the rotation of the Earth uh, to, to obtain uh, sufficient information to, to image uh, such an object. Uh, there is, of course, a concern that the image is kind of blurred. Our defense is uh, that the resolution is as good as we can have. And for there is a nice comparison made by Alex Parker. Uh, this is one pixel of Hubble telescope that we are looking at, this uh, uh, white uh, um, uh, uh, square. Uh, and now we are zooming in to see the image of the event uh, horizon telescope with its resolution. Again, we are inside one pixel of the uh, of the Hubble Space Telescope, and here, we, if we zoom a lot, this is the uh, the Event Horizon Telescope image. So it's really uh, something, and uh, well, it is blurry, but we are doing our best in terms of resolution. It's difficult to do uh, to do better. Um, so what array do we need to uh, to perform observations uh, like that? Well, we do need telescopes to be located and uh, at different locations around the globe if we want to use Earth as an effective uh, telescope dish. So we have telescopes all the way from Spain to Hawaii and all the way from the green from Greenland to to the South Pole. Uh, this is just listing the participants of the 2017 campaign, which is the observation I am uh, talking about. And this is just to show you how we are slowly improving. So uh, historically, we did observations from uh, starting from 2009, the observations of M87 with a small array. 2017 is the data I am talking about and the results I am talking about. And we have already 2018 data and 2021 data that are still not analyzed, but we do what we did collect the data. And you can expect even better images, better constraints coming from those data sets in a couple of years when we finally manage to, uh, to work on, uh, on the analysis of those. Uh, some more nice picture of people. I do want to move on to the uh, to the second part of my talk, so I will just you know just see how what what beautiful people uh, we have. Um, 
Oh, this is um, uh, another slide just uh, showing you this principle of uh, sampling with the uh, very long baseline interferometer. How do we sample the image? So this V of UV, these are visibilities that Guillermo was mentioning. This is the Fourier plane of the image. So as the Earth is rotating, the geometry of the system is changing and we are probing different uh, Fourier components of the image. And these components are called visibilities. And if we have enough of them, they are complex. If we have enough of them, we can attempt to reconstruct the image. Why does it work? The basis of this work is the theorem of Van Sitter Zernik, which is just telling you that propagation in the vacuum is pretty much taking a Fourier transform of the uh, of, of, of the source, which is uh, well, in, in the uh, in, in certain approximation of small angle, but we are talking about very, very small angles of micro arc seconds. So this is the beauty of nature that this um, uh, propagation in the, in the vacuum is actually pretty much uh, taking a, a, a Fourier transform. And, th and this is why we can do the thing we are uh, th that the thing that we are doing, that we measure Fourier transform components uh, and they can be uh, turned uh, into the uh, uh, distant image with incredible uh, resolution. Uh, this is, I hope, kind of last slide about this part of the talk and we'll get to the juicy part about the uh, image morphology. So this is just uh, to, to reiterate how, how things are really difficult. Uh, you have to gather all those data sets, uh, uh, put them on uh, hard disk drives, uh, there are petabytes of data that you cannot send through the internet, so you have to uh, manually, well, put them on a plane and uh, take them to, to a location to perform uh, correlation. Then there is a lot of calibration to mitigate the, the atmospheric um, turbulences, and only then you get um, uh, enough data that is uh, of quality sufficient to try to perform the image reconstruction. So to take this Fourier uh, plane data that are just sparsely sampled and try attempt to turn it into the image domain. This is another uh, difficult uh, uh, task. Uh, a couple of slides about uh, other difficulties and how, how it is altogether really well, we well, not, maybe not weird, but <laughs> kind of um, surprising that everything came together um, uh, and things uh, worked like that. So one problem number one, atmospheric uh, opacity. At gigahertz frequencies, atmosphere is actually quite unfriendly uh, and it's eating away a lot of the, the, the radiation through absorption. So we have, we are using two windows uh, where we actually can see uh, stuff. Uh, the, Couple of other happy cosmic coincidences why this observation could happen is that the Earth diameter is sufficient. We, of course, if we were living on a smaller planet, we still wouldn't have the uh, first image of M87. On the other hand, we could hope for a larger planet and then we would be, uh, we would be seeing with better resolution with VLBI. Uh, Earth atmosphere is transparent. It has windows of transparency in this millimeter wavelengths and we are trying to fit into these windows. Uh, another happy coincidence is that this uh, limit of our abilities where we can observe, which is one millimeter, is pretty much co coincident with the maximum of synchrotron emission in Sagittarius A star and also in M87. Uh, you can see here the spectrum from Sag A star, not from the M87, and you can see that this is the EHT window. So we are really close to the maximum meaning we can actually see something. We, uh, if you know, if there was uh, three orders of magnitude less radiation, then we wouldn't have sensitivity to, uh, to construct the, the, the image, to record the, uh, the observations. When, well, then the, another happy thing, uh, another happy coincidence is the transparency of the accretion flow for one millimeter wavelength. So this is about the, this peak, the synchrotron radiation is optically thick here on this branch. Uh, and it's getting optically thin here uh, in this branch. Meaning, uh, if we want to see all the way to the horizon, we cannot observe here on this uh, shoulder, on this slope here, because it's optically thick and we wouldn't see uh, the shadow. We would see the photosphere surrounding it. 
On the other hand, we cannot go too much into the optically thin regime because then the um, amount of uh, radiation is getting lower. So we really are in this happy, uh, happy spot um, where we can do uh, th these things. Then the speed of electronics that was uh, growing according to Moore's law and only sometime in 2015, we reached this sort of bit rates uh, where we could record this uh, sort of observation that we wanted to record for, for M87 and for uh, Sagittarius A star. Uh, then there is this uh, thing that I have uh, mentioned and that you all, uh, you are all fans of gravity theory, so we all know that this uh, shadow feature is lensed by a factor of about 250%, uh, um, meaning it's not the, the size of event horizon as it would be in flat space time, it is uh, enlarged by this effect of um, photon lensing. And here is just a, a, a tiny little movie showing a bunch of photons and how uh, they interact with the space time of, um, uh, of a Schwarzschild uh, black hole. Uh, and you can see this deflection. So this deflection is causing that the size seen by the different distant observer is not this black uh, spot uh, you see here, but instead it's larger and it's larger by a lot, by square root of 27, which gives us efficient size of this feature so that we could actually observe it and resolve it with the Event Horizon Telescope. Well, another happy coincidence is that M87 is absolutely huge. Uh, it's 6.5 uh, billion solar masses. Uh, so it's a really large black hole. Uh, relatively nearby in a cosmic sense. So it is large in terms of angular uh, dimension. And we had amazing weather in 2017. It was actually a rare uh, occurrence of extremely good weather all around the globe for a couple of days for all our um, uh, sites. It won't happen again. Uh, I, well, it's unexpected to happen again with such great weather. Uh, in near future. It's like uh, it was estimated to be once in like 20 or 30 years that the weather would be so good. Uh, I, I'm showing a lot of stuff about this first part of the talk, but let's let's keep on going. Um, so uh, this is just uh, how well the image becomes constrained, uh, the more data you, uh, you gather. So as the night po progresses and we reconstruct the aperture, we synthesize the aperture, uh, you are getting better and better constraints of the image. So it turns from the blob into this well-constrained uh, uh, shape of, a, uh, of an asymmetric ring. I think I got to the part about which I really wanted to talk uh, to you about. Uh, so the part about the morphology of the image. So let's start this with, uh, with this um, uh, image comparing observation and the model, model coming from GRMHD. Um, so this is just a, a little piece of, of like propaganda image that if you blur the model, you really get something very similar to our observations. So the reason why we don't see all these nice features is just because we lack resolution, but the images are consistent with this sort of model coming from the, uh, from the numerical uh, simulations. And now I will uh, spend the rest of my talk um, uh, giving you some details about this morphology of this, um, uh, of this uh, observed object. So as I said, uh, the shadow, I will refer as a shadow to the, to the general image, the whole thing that there is something dark in the center and there is something bright around it. Then there will be uh, photon rings, which will be those sharp, uh, highly lensed features. Then there is an inner shadow, which is kind of a new thing, um, uh, theoretically introduced in re recent papers. This is this inner dark inner edge of the uh, of the emission. So one could say this is an actually a limit of the outline of the of the event horizon. Uh, I, I will describe it a little more. Uh, and then there is a critical curve, which is occasionally or often referred in literature as a shadow. This is this theoretical outline that Bardeen calculated, which is not an observable. It is a theoretical uh, construction. Uh, so this is like a little table uh, telling, uh, well, giving you some details about um, these different uh, components of the image. So let's say that we have uh, this shadow, this overall appearance, 
Um, uh, it has been observed uh, by EHT, by these M87 observations, and there is a column here, dependence of, on gastrophysics. Gastrophysics is a word coined by Sam Grala, which I really enjoy. This is astrophysics of gas, uh, meaning this is not uh, ethics of GR. So this is uh, uh, what is the impact of the model of the, of the emission and not of the uh, model of um, uh, underlying gravity theory. So shadow is a uh, feature strongly affected by uh, gastrophysics. Then there are those photon rings, which are less strongly dependent on gastrophysics. Uh, they are also, in principle, they can be observed, but it's fair to say that we didn't actually observe them. In numerical models, they constitute like 10% of the total emission. Uh, so they, we probably record some of the photons that uh, come uh, through the photon rings to the distant observer, but we cannot really re distinguish between them and the shadow. So I think the uh, fair answer is here that we did not observe photon rings yet. Um, however, it would be very nice to, to do it, and I will talk about it a little more. When there is this inner shadow feature, which is also an, observ uh, an observable, uh, so, uh, did we observe it? Well, we may have constrained it because we have some upper limit on the uh, size of this dark part inside this fluffy, bright uh, stuff around. But it's not, it's not a strong constraint uh, at the moment. And then there is a critical curve that I have mentioned already, which is fully independent of gastrophysics. It only depends on the underlying theory of gravity. However, it's not an observable, it's a theoretical construct and it hasn't been observed and it won't be observed because it's a theoretical construct and no photons actually correspond to the critical curve. The, so we, which makes a problem, makes a fact uh, a little bit problematic that most of, of the research that people published about images of black holes actually focuses on this critical uh, curve and its geometry as a function of, of the metric. Uh, well, this is just an image I have stolen from NASA to, to show you how complicated uh, this uh, image of black hole can be to interpret because photons are not traveling on uh, straight lines, but I don't think I will linger uh, too, too long on this one. Um, uh, I will just uh, move on. Okay, so uh, let's talk. I will just show you now a couple of slides about these different components of the image, um, and that will be it. So this is the shadow of a black hole, the, this feature that is just an overall appearance of the, of the image. And he, here you see an uh, image from the paper by Thomas uh, Bronswire, uh, which shows you an example of how this thing uh, could look. There are a couple of things that are really important to notice here. Uh, and I mentioned already that uh, these uh, solutions of radiatively inefficient accretion flows are not at all like thin disks. So I would like to list a couple of reasons why they are not at all like thin disks. And you shouldn't really use a thin disk model to try to interpret uh, images from the Event Horizon Telescope. So first thing, they are optically thin, unlike thin disk, which is optically thick. They are geometrically thick, unlike thin disk, which is um, geometrically thin. Um, the flux extends to the event horizon in these models, uh, typically. This is uh, another difference from thin disk, when you terminate flux at the, at the ISCO location. Uh, the densities are extremely low, uh, comparing to densities uh, in a thin disk. Mass accretion rate is extremely low. It can be 10 to minus 5 Eddington, about 10 to minus 4 for M87. It can be 10 to minus 8, which, we, which is what we expect for, for such a star. Uh, it is very hot. Uh, the uh, electrons are pretty much limited by the virial temperature. The, well, ions and, and electrons. Electrons are actually cooling down. So let's say that it's ion temperature that we are talking about. Uh, this is much hotter than the thin disk uh, solution. Um, you don't need magnetic field uh, in this um, system to emit any radiation because this rad uh, any radiation observed by the VLBI because this is synchrotron radiation we are uh, observing, we are talking about. It is not really a fluid. Uh, it is uh, uh, collisionless. It doesn't really follow the MHD model. Then there is a question, are our numerical simulations really capturing the behavior of this system? And the honest answer is, 
Well, I, I think the honest answer is we don't know. We are just using the best model we have, but you have to uh, keep in mind that be, at these densities that we are talking about at, in RIAPs, it's not really a fluid. GRMHD, the MHD part of GRMHD is not really a, a proper model for that. Um, and the, the mechanism for the dissipative heating and how electrons are, uh, and ions are actually heated in this system is rather poorly understood. So we usually prescribe it in simulations. We don't have like, uh, you know, fully physical model that everything is calculated from first principles. And shadow depends on gastrophysics. So this is just an example from uh, one image from the EHT uh, paper uh, where we vary uh, a sort of plasma parameter. This is a parameter capturing this dissipative heating. Uh, and this is a spin of a black hole. So you can see, uh, so this is space time, but this is the vertical line uh, is not space time. This is just uh, gastrophysics. And you can see how much different the images can be when you turn uh, the astrophysical knobs and not the space time itself. So uh, this, well, this can be disturbing in a sense that probably we cannot say all that much about uh, space time geometry if we have these huge uncertainties coming from the astrophysics. So what EHT does to try to mitigate that is we consider thousands and thousands of different uh, images from different models uh, uh, from GRMHD. Uh, and we are trying to aggregate them to be able to you know, marginalize the effects of astrophysics and try to uh, say, still say something about the, about the space time. So we do that with over 60,000 uh, simulated snapshots. Uh, but there are different ways that one could try to get to space time and forget about this dependence on gastrophysics. So the way to do that is to look at the sharp features, about the, um, to, uh, to look at photon rings. So photon rings, it turns out they depend far, uh, to far less extent on the uh, astrophysical constraints. And the higher order of this um, lens image, the less dependent it is on the, uh, uh, on the effects of astrophysics. So n equals zero is this direct emission shadow. Uh, then there is this uh, focused uh, sharp feature of n equal one. And then you can see, of course, infinity, infinite number of those. The problem is um, uh, they are exp exponentially less intense. There, there is less and less photons that uh, linger around the photon shell long enough to be lensed uh, so strongly. So there is a sensitivity issue. Can we ever, uh, can we ever detect things like that? Uh, and there, is, there has been some work saying that we could. And in particular, I'd like to point your atten attention to this Johnson et al. 2020 paper, which is actually giving you this sort of very optimistic idea that, well, we are doing interferometry here. And uh, interferometry is perfectly uh, suited to look at sharp features in the image, because that's how, if, how Fourier uh, works. Fourier is great at capturing sharp features, sharp features at very high spat uh, spatial frequencies. So if you have an image of a black hole, all this fluffy stuff, uh, fluffy random stuff from the direct image flowing around, this all dies out in high frequencies, in high special frequencies. But if there is a constant a sharp feature like a photon ring, then this guy should dominate the signal at very, very high spatial frequencies. So the problem is that we cannot access these very high spatial frequencies yet. We probably will need to go to space and probably not even to nearby space, but probably to L2 or to the moon to actually do good science with, uh, with photon rings. Um, this is an image from the paper that I'm currently writing. I think I will, uh, for the sake of time, if somebody could tell me how am I doing with time, could somebody tell me? Are you there? Yes. I, okay, sorry. I was <laughs> super worried that maybe I'm <laughs> talking to the, into the void. So, Deborah, yes. how am I doing with time? 
Uh, you have five, five minutes. You, I have five minutes. Well, okay, so I will stretch it. Um, okay, so uh, I, then I will describe this uh, this figure that I'm that I am showing here. So uh, let me try to explain to you this complicated figure that that you are looking at. So this figure is showing something that Grala and others called a transfer function. So this is the connection between the emission region. Um, where the photon was emitted in the boyer linquist coordinates uh, near the black hole, and then where it goes into the uh, on the screen of the ob distant observer. So this is where it goes on a screen of uh, observer. The red uh, lines is the direct image. So this shadow or n equal zero photon ring, however you want to call it. And there are two examples of space times here. There is a Schwarzschild space time and Reisner Nordstrom with uh, charge of one, just an, as an example of a space type. And you can see how this transfer function works, the thick line uh, for Schwarzschild and the thin light for Reisner Nordstrom. It doesn't, it's not different. It's not very different. And another thing, it's, it, it looks like it uh, obeys a very simple formula that Grala called just add one formula. And this formula is telling you, if you want to know where your shadow is, you take um, your measured impact parameter, which is uh, proportional to the diameter you measure um, uh, in the image. So just the diameter of the shadow of a, uh, of a black hole seen by us observed in M87, you subtract one, well, uh, Grala wrote add one because you know this one is in his approach on the other side. Uh, you subtract one, and you get the radius of the emission. So you get where the photons have been emitted. So uh, what, it, what this figure means is you cannot distinguish very well between Schwarzschild and Reisner Nordstrom if you are looking at this direct emission, because uh, it is telling you only about the location of the emission in the boiling with coordinates, forgetting about space time. All it tells you is this is the measurement of the Event Horizon Telescope, and it tells you that, well, Clearly, the photon was emitted about 4.6 uh, radii, uh, mass radii, um, if it's Schwarzschild, and maybe 4.7 if it's Reisner Nordstrom. But so, really, it constrains the location of the emission. It doesn't constrain the space time. However, if you were to look at the photon ring number one, this is the blue line you can see how this transfer function works for Schwarzschild. This is this thick dashed blue line and how it works for uh, Reisner Nordstrom, this line. And now you can see that if you measure diameter of a black hole, diameter of the first photon ring of a black hole, you can immediately distinguish between those space times because if you get something more than five, uh, five M, then only Schwarzschild, uh, is in agreement with that. Reisner Nordstrom is not in agreement with that. And if you measure something below, below say 4.6, then it cannot be Schwarzschild. You have just shown that this uh, um, uh, image is incompatible with Schwarzschild space time. So there is a power to constrain metric inside the, the science of photon rings. Uh, this is another uh, figure from this uh, paper I am working on, which is stressing that uh, the direct image is really measuring compactness. So what you see here are characteristic radii, ISCO, marginally bound, photon radius, horizon radius, as a function of charge in different models of space-time. So there is just a bunch of Reisner Nordstroms, Bar Bardeen, regular black hole, and different different models of, um, uh, of uh, space-times. Uh, and you can see uh, where is the image of that characteristic radius, and where is the, what is the rule just at one telling you? So this is dashed line for just at one, this approximated formula. And uh, continuous line is where this image of characteristic radius goes in the uh, distant observer's plane. You can see they are very similar for all the space times. So what it means, uh, you can really use this rule just at one to tell you if you measure uh, diameter of a black hole where the emission happened. And this is pretty much independent from the, from the space time, which makes a very nice conclusion that maybe EHT, well, 
maybe these uh, uh, constraints of the space time are not great uh, from the direct emission. But what is great, you measure compactness because you do measure where the emission is pretty much independent of the space time. So we can say that uh, EHT have measured the compactness uh, measured as uh, you know diameter uh, in units of mass um, or radius in the units of mass to be about 4.5. Yeah, about 4.5. 4, 4. So the uh, rate, region of emission is about 4.5 um, mass radii uh, in radius. Okay, I will very quickly go through the rest of the slides. Uh, this is another uh, figure from this work in, in prep uh, where I am trying to use this second photon ring to uh, show the difference between those um, uh, different models of space time. And you can see that from n equal one photon ring, you get some constraints, but they are poor, meaning all those uh, bands pretty much overlap. But if you get to second photon ring, if you make a measurement, of uh, diameter of a black hole, which would be this uh, L over M, uh, you could make good constraints of things like, on things like charges of those black holes. You could exclude some of those uh, special kinds of uh, space times uh, using the science of a photon. My last two slides about two other concepts uh, uh, that I have mentioned. So the critical curve, comment on the critical curve. It's beautiful calculation following what Bardeen did in 1973 and what many people did, including, uh, including Leah Medeiros for uh, very general uh, types of space times. Uh, however, the, while the beauty of it is that it is independent of the astrophysics, it's independent of the location of the emission. However, again, it's not observable. Observing a uh, shadow of the M87, the image that EHT registers ha can have little to do with this critical curve. And unfortunately, a lot, a lot of research is trying to directly interpret the image of a black hole from the Event Horizon Telescope as a constraint on critical curve. So I am trying to make it clear that not uh, that is not exactly the same thing. There is an additional level of carefulness, which is also uh, what Guillermo mentioned in his talk, that they are now trying to do PCA on the images, not on the critical curves, which is uh, this work by Lia Medeiros. Is a, it is PCA on critical curves. Uh, inner shadow, it's a relatively recent thing to point out that we could do science um, with uh, the inner edge of brightness. So if you imagine that the emission is all the way to the horizon, of course at the horizon it's infinitely redshifted, so you don't see the horizon. But imagine that this uh, uh, emission is uh, growing exponentially uh, all the way to the horizon, so the most of the photons are emitted very, very close to the horizon. Then this inner edge of darkness is uh, letting you probe the shape uh, and size of the of the event horizon in, in some sort of limit, or at least to put a limit on the diameter and uh, shape of the of the event horizon. So this is the uh, uh, beautiful uh, thing pointed out in the recent paper by Andrew Chail, um, where where he did uh, a lot of analytic uh, approximations for this uh, inner shadow curve, how it should look, and what kind of uh, things we could learn about space-time uh, making these constraints on the, uh, uh, on the event horizon uh, shape. Uh, oh, I said that would be my, no, sorry, I have two more, sli two more slides. Um, this is the work we have done with Frederick Van Son and with Marek Abramovich, who might be at this conference, I think, uh, where we compared, uh, this morphology of the image uh, uh, across different space times. So we tried to match the image of the Event Horizon tele uh, Telescope with images constructed in different space times. We have Kerr here, we have Boson Star, and a special kind of wormhole. And what I would like to point your attention to is that the image, when blurred, which represents approximate, approximately this uh, image that Event Horizon Telescope could get, it looks very similar. However, you can see a huge difference in terms of highly lensed features. You can see care with a single visible photon ring corresponding to this first photon ring in care space time. You can see boson star, which has no photon ring, 
Uh, and you can see Lamy a wormhole, which has uh, two different families uh, of, uh, of photon rings. So this is just an, another piece of propaganda telling you that if we could ever get to high spatial frequencies, we could see these very, you know, uh, topological differences. We could see that uh, maybe, maybe there is no photon ring. Maybe it's a boson star, maybe there are no photon rings. Maybe there are a couple of families of photon rings because it's a wormhole. This is something that we could do uh, with uh, high frequency and looking at the photon rings features. And this is really my last slide, uh, just another advertisement of, uh, of uh, the work that, that I did uh, last year with um, Iri Horak, who I hope is also around, I don't know, and Marek, Marek Abramovich and Frederick Vanson. So this is just an attempt to um, and make another statement about topological difference, much like here, that there are different family, couple of families of photon rings. So this is just a, a consideration of a general space time in which you would have these multiple families of photon rings. So uh, we had this idea that if you have your uh, effective photon potential that is not symmetric, then you could see one family of photon rings corresponding to the photon shell on one side of the wormhole, or, you know, it actually works for a boson star as well, um, or boson-like, boson star-like space-time. Uh, you have one family, but in case of a wormhole, you have one family of, uh, of photon rings corresponding to a critical curve, related to a critical curve on one side of the space-time. And then this is the throat of a wormhole here, here you are going to a different universe on the other side of your wormhole, and there is another photon shell. And this another photon shell will also produce a family of lensed photon rings for you. So you can have two families uh, seen uh, uh, inside this wormhole. And if, if we ever observed M87 or any other object, and we saw that, well, there are a couple of families of photon rings that we see, we would immediately know Okay, this cannot be a care space time. Maybe it is, it is a wormhole after all. Okay, I will end with that. Thank you very much. And I, I, I am hoping for some discussion. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes, yeah. Well, uh... The sentence which uh, I think uh, is appropriate to use is uh, very interesting. If to and uh, I am really concerned because uh, in the MG15 when Harker was supposed to do the talking, finally did not okay, get, but went on presenting the idea and the observation later on, the model of black hole was moving extremely fast, the concept of black hole. And the party more and more from the classical idea of a structured black hole. And the needless to say from the rise and north of the or uh, uh, any, any one of these objects. And the picture mature that indeed you don't tell a black hole like care of uh, Schwarzschild or Heiser Nostrum, but you have a much more complex system which couples the care solution to magnetic field. You don't have vacuum. I don't want to go much further. And uh, this uh, idea shows that very likely the first of all that the rotational energy of the pair 
is very important, but not as a clear solution. But as a solution with the magnetic field, and we will discuss this matter maybe tomorrow. And, and we see also evidence for a mission which is not time constant, but this time back. Therefore, very likely, if you keep watching M87, you will see from the horizon, not from the horizon, from whatever is there, an emission. And they reporting this on time scale of the order of um, 60 seconds or so. But this is just uh, an idea which we will present tomorrow shortly. I would like just to be, I've been, I've been working in this field for many years, and um, I am uh, amazed how much the future is changing all day over day. And the time of uh, MG uh, 15, when Falke was supposed to give a talk, was not yet there. It has been there in MG 16, just a, a few months ago. And uh, I would like you to urge to look also possibly material which will be presented tomorrow. But the picture of the black hole is extremely different. Though ideally uh, linked to the one which we present with John Weaver in the beginning, the name is still there, but already a few months later than the John Weaver paper, we introduced the concept later on in uh, the Zouche that uh, black holes are alive. Okay, now we can say not the black holes, but whatever system that is there is alive. And on short time scale, it's just a comment. I, I, I didn't get uh, all of it very well, but let me, let me, uh, I, I mean, <laughs> I was making a little note for myself what, uh, what to comment. Uh, uh, on so uh, I I think you brought up uh, Heino Falke's um, uh, kind of uh, universality of uh, shadow ideas that uh, uh, he he has since his um, uh, tw twenty twenty uh, paper. I must say there, there is just a little bit of uh, maybe I wouldn't uh, wouldn't call it disagreement. I would uh, call it a difference in where we what we emphasize. So Heino is uh, stressing uh, understanding of the physical model of the flow, and he wants to build that, that uh, universal character on understood characteristic uh, of the of the Raya uh, flows. Uh, and then the, the other side of this coin or the other approach is to emphasize that it, it, it's not the case that we actually understand uh, the astrophysics that well, uh, particularly where are where are the electrons that are actually contributing to the image that uh, that we observe. And uh, this is the approach where we are trying to say, well, to actually do um, a science of gravity, to actually probe it, you do need to go into these um, uh, uh, highly lensed features, which are less dependent on astrophysics. But of course, there is this another approach where you say that, well, the other thing we can do is we can try to understand the astrophysics so well that we can really say with certainty, the electrons that are contributing to this emission are exactly at this location, at exactly this um, uh, uh, distribution of velocities and such. So that's the that, that, that's my comment on on, uh, on that. And you also raised this um, uh, point that uh, there are non-horizon ways um, to uh, to distinguish um, uh, care space-time. Uh, of course. There are more constraints than the image itself. The image is pretty independent to a lot of astrophysical constraints. And if, if the jets are powered 
by um, a blandford znaik mechanism, then you can, of course, put constraints on the, uh, you can look at the jet, at energetic output of the jet, and you can exclude some low spin um, uh, examples of, uh, of space times where this uh, energy would not be extracted efficiently. And that is actually what EHT, uh, what we did, we, we did, uh, claim that we exclude uh, uh, zero spin solutions for M87 based uh, not on the image, but based on the power, um, uh, luminous power in the jet. So these are the two little notes that I made <laughs> to, uh, to, to, to comment on. Thank you. Let's see if there are more questions. Anyone here? Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the nice talk. And um, I want to ask you about if um, if you could comment on the observations of uh, Sagittarius A star shadow. Like I know, from my understanding, it's more challenging because the time scales, I um, mean, the size are shorter, so it's more complicated to do the, the correlation, I guess. But is there like how so it, will that be possible? And if so, like in the days future. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I can, uh, I am, at, I think, at liberty to, to give you a limited amount of details. So it is totally uh, doable. The problems with the, with the algorithm are pretty much sorted out uh, at this point. It is just the inertia of writing papers. I, that's how I would, uh, I, I would call it. So, uh, you know, at this point, I could really bet that next at next rack, rack time I will be discussing uh, Sagittarius A star. I know I said that last year, but then I wasn't sure. But now, now I am sure. So all of that, uh, all of these problems like uh, uh, fast variability time scale for Sage, of course, they are limiting what we can say, but. In that sense, we just have to take them into account when doing the, the analysis. And that, that, that was the problem, how to take into account these effects. And this is mostly uh, variability scale and scattering. Uh, that is uh, where we have interstellar uh, scattering uh, towards Sagittarius that is also limiting what we can uh, claim and what we can infer uh, from, from the data. So all of that needed to be built into our algorithm. So the new algorithm needed to be built, but it is all done. We are at the, at the stage where we are trying to report on the results the best we can, and we are arguing about how to do it exactly. So it's a couple of months, I believe, that you'll have to wait for Sagittarius. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any last question, anybody? Okay, then if, if not, then thank you again. Hi, Hi it's Maurizio. One, one question about Sagittarius C star. To observe Sagittarius C star, it's just a matter of resolution, if I understood correctly. So I am not sure if the event horizon telescope improved the resolution of having new telescopes. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, that, that's not, not at all the concern. The resolution for Sagittarius is not a concern. Actually, from the M over D, ma mass over distance, we do expect that Sagittarius is about 20% larger in diameter than M87. So in terms of resolution, it is easier to get um, Sagittarius A star. The problem is variability time scale and uh, scattering towards the uh, galactic center. Oh, I see. All right. So let's thank Machik again. Oh. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to meeting you in person again. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you for today.